Can we give them a big hand? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. What does one do? So I'm going to match to what does one do if they have had premarital sex? Like, how does one heal and overcome so tight issues? So, I think this person is saying, We've made mistakes in the past. I've had premarital sex. Uh, if one has done that and you spoke about it tonight, how does one heal or overcome so tight issues? Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, so I think the first thing is you first need to repent. And by repent, I don't just mean apologize to God. I mean you need to change the way you think. Um, f the f reason why you've had premarital sex is because you think it's okay. You first need to see it as the sin that it is and then retrace your steps from there. Um, the second thing would be to find someone you can both be accountable to. So I would suggest going to maybe um, your pastor or a Christian, an older Christian that you respect so that they can keep an eye on both of you. Um, and you have to have very clear boundaries set. So for instance, all those, oh, we're locking ourselves in the room, we want to pray, all those things that you tell yourself that you know will end up in sin. Stop doing those things. Stop being in private places, just two of you alone together. Um, you just have to have very strong boundaries and um, people that can hold you accountable. Okay, and um, I also assume, <coughs> excuse me, I assume that the person might not be dating the person anymore, or might not, because you mentioned soul ties. Um, in those kind of cases also, um, you need to formally break it, all right, in terms of prayer and the word, you need to formally break it and cut off any ties you have with that person, spirit, soul, and body. So spiritually break it in prayer and stand your authority as a child of God. Um, physically, if this person is not somebody you're getting married to, stop hanging out with them, stop spending time with them, stop keeping in touch, all right? I see many people that they want to stop a life of sin, but you are keeping in touch with the, your partner in sin. You are just tempting the devil. It's not devil tempting you. You are the one tempting the devil. So you need to break those contacts. Then if you have anything that is still associating both of you together, do your best to break it off. As powerful as addictions or um, um, soul ties can be, if, if the person is not in your space for a long time, you find that you begin to gain strength over that thing. But as long as they're in your space, they are weakening you every day. All right? So break contact if you can, both spirit, soul, and body. All right? And when you break those contacts, just like Jesus said, when you cast out one demon, you need to fill your heart with the word of God, all right? With other things. So it's not just saying, no, I'm not just saying you start wandering up and down. No, fill your heart with the word of God and with other useful activities, all right, that will build you up, yes. Give the Lord a big hand, everybody. Wow. Now, there are a couple of questions, at least four of them, that are around one central theme about should everyone even get... Uh, Married, and somebody is, is quoting the Bible here, saying First Corinthians chapter seven, that um, uh, is there everybody that should get married eventually, or um, uh, I think this person, a couple of people are asking. First of all, is marriage for everyone? I think that's the basic question. Is marriage for everyone? And what if I don't feel like? Okay, okay. she will, she will read the scripture and answer. So Matthew 19 from verse 11 to 12, the message translation, I'll start from 10. Um, Jesus was talking to them about, you know, adultery and things like that. And verse 10 says, Jesus' disciples objected. If those are the terms of marriage, we haven't got a chance. Why get married? Verse 11 says, but Jesus said, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought. 
Others never get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. So Jesus is very clear here that not everyone will get married. And I know it's not the truth we like to hear in church. Um, people don't like to hear those kind of things. Some people will not get married. Some for kingdom reasons. You know, look at Apostle Paul, for instance. If you were Apostle Paul's wife, would you allow him to be shipwrecked, flogged, left for dead, and then he'll come back and say he's going tomorrow again? Uncle, you can't go anyway. You can't go. And then they'll lock you up in prison. And then he's there taking, talking about rejoice. I can't be rejoicing. My husband is in prison. Please don't annoy me. You know, so he... He, his life was one that could not accommodate a wife. So marriage was... But you see, the thing is, it also was clear from scripture that he wasn't one who... He had become an, a spiritual eunuch. So he didn't... The Bible didn't record any time where oh, he had a girlfriend, but you know, he just decided not to. So some people will say, oh, I think I'm, I'm not called to marry, but you are sleeping around. If you are called to be a, a eunuch for kingdom reasons, you are also called to purity. It means that you are not following through. Even if your body is burning, you know it's a sacrifice, a life of sacrifice. So yes, not everyone will get married. Not everyone should get married, in my opinion. There are some people that are not ready. And personally, I believe if you, it's, instead of spoiling marriage for us, leave it for us. If you know you're not going to do it well, just leave it. So... Um, to answer your question, yes, not everyone will get married. Number two, um, if you do, Jesus says if you do, because marriage requires a certain le level of grace, a certain level of deciding to obey God at all times. You know what it is for someone to consistently annoy you, and God says, I want you to love them without judging them. Your husband is not acting respectable, and God is saying you must respect and honor him and venerate him. Do you know what it means? Venerate, venerating someone is like worshiping the person. God is saying, even this, when this woman is not lovable, I want you to lay down your life. In fact, do it the way Jesus did it. How did Jesus do it? Jesus anticipated our need. He knew that we would need a savior. So he came and he knew the price that that savior would need to pay. And he died without us asking. And without even knowing whether we would accept the gift he was giving us. So when I hear men say, oh, after all I've done for her, see how she's acting. I'm saying, you're not even half. Jesus died. And some of us have still not accepted him as our Lord and Savior. So that's the level of love he's talking about. Even when this woman is not lovable, I want you to love her. Be committed to her. If you are not ready to do these things, then don't get married. Because marriage will stretch you. Marriage will place a demand on you to give and keep giving. One of the most shocking things for me about marriage is how much marriage will pull on you. When you think you've given enough, marriage will stretch you even more. At the beginning of this year, I'm going to throw Pastor under the bus right now. <laughs> At the beginning of this year, this man told me that we're going to take things easy this year. When we're just going to do a few ministrations here and there. We've been traveling everywhere. we from the UK. In fact, we entered London. The next day we're in Manchester. Then we're in Birmingham. Then we were next weekend after that. We're in Scotland. Then we went into Ireland. In fact, we snuck into Ireland. We, I'm not even going to tell that story. But anyhow, we got into Ireland. Came out of that. Have I counted the complete five? And then he says, oh, let's just quickly... Just quickly enter the U.S. Not since not only trust me, it's not. And baby, I want you to rest. It's not saying all that. Just don't worry yourself. And we got into the U.S. And as we landed L.A., did the L.A. conference. The next morning, we left there, went to San Francisco. He preached there. The next day, we went to Houston, stayed there for three days. Then we went to Michigan yesterday. Then from Michigan, we're here. Then from here tomorrow, we're in Canada. From Canada, we're going back to London. From London, we're in Doha. Then before we go home. This was not what this man told me. <laughs> but you see, <laughs> the thing about marriage is, once you say, I do, when you take those vows, you need to put your vows above your feelings. I was sitting there this evening. I haven't even said that one to you. We're going to fight later. In the night. I 
was sitting down this evening. Pastor K and I, we have concluded that next year is our rest year. Oh, next year, we're not going to travel like this. We're going to take it easy. And then two of my beautiful daughters came to visit me this evening. Spiritual daughters came to visit me this evening. And they showed me on the website that, oh, mama, we didn't know you're going to be in, in the UK next year. There's LDM 2024. I said, what? It's said, February 2024. Where? Look at it. I'm like, what? <laughs> Honestly, I thought this year I'd given it all. But you see, well, that's what marriage will do to you. You promised God that you would partner with God to make sure that your partner fulfills their destiny. And so even when you are too tired to keep going, marriage will make that demand on you to keep giving. Give me more and give me more. And you see, when people get frustrated is when there's only one person giving. I'm giving, but I can guarantee you that he's doing a lot more than I'm doing. And so that's what marriage is. So if you know you don't have the capacity to do it well, Jesus says, don't bother. But if you can, I advise you to do it. It will change your life. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's awesome. I would like to. Yeah, Pastor K, I would like you to comment on, yes. on this issue. I have to defend myself. <laughs> yeah. Because, Please don't believe everything. She because said. so here's, here's a caveat to the question. You're, you've accepted a preaching engagement in February 2024 with a flyer that was already out, but your wife didn't know about it. Okay. Engagement. So, so can we talk about that? Okay. Engagement. Okay. Praise God. Uh, don't believe everything she has said. <laughs> First of all. <laughs> Making me look very bad. Okay. Uh, uh, let me talk a bit about the marriage question also. Um, yes, she has made you understand that it's not everybody that will get married, and that's the truth. Especially if you're a Christian and you want to wait on God and make sure you marry another Christian. Some people might not get asked, like she said, some might not get accepted. That's the reality of the case. However, um, for those that have the opportunity to get married, it's such a blessing. You know, um, there's so much. Maybe that's what I'll teach tomorrow about the purposes of marriage. If you understand the purposes for marriage, then you will understand why you need to trust God to get married. Because if one person is so great, imagine when you have two of these people partnering together. Hallelujah. Imagine that. And the Bible says two are better than one. So if you think you are so spiritual, you are so godly, you, are so, you love God, imagine when you have somebody doing it with you. The results will be multiplied. So marriage is such a blessing. And the, the unbelievers are bringing children into the world. You know, they are not even thinking twice about having children. But you see Christians that are born again, that are godly, saying, oh, we don't want to have what I want. We don't want to No. The Bible said, be fruitful and multiply. Children is part of the thing God wants from a marriage. Godly seed. So godly people need to have more children. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yes. That's what God wants, to populate this earth with godly people. Amen. So if you understand the purposes of marriage, you will see that marriage is such a beautiful... I don't know if there's, any, there's anything as beautiful that God put on this earth like marriage. I don't know if there's anything else that is as beautiful like marriage that God put on this earth. So when you're, that's why I'm saying the young men in the house, please marry on time. You are, it's very good woman. You are missing so much. You know, you are missing so much. The Bible said a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband's head. You are missing. If you have a good woman in your life, she will accelerate your life. Your life won't be the same. All right? So, um, that's very important. Now, to all the accusations. <laughs> um, um, the February meetings are not concrete. Um, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, wow. I will explain. Um, we have, um, no, I will explain. So, um, we have a team that need to apply for visas. So, part of the requirements is that. Uh, Social media. Uh -huh. So they are the one that brought it up. No, 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 no. Okay, but I'll give I'll give you I'll give the energy. So part of it is that you must have fixed itinerary. So those itinerary are not fixed. However, you need to present yeah. um, an itinerary. All right. So sometimes our team just sets up an itinerary. Even me, I've not seen those itinerary. They set it up and to present for the team because those people need time to get their own visas. People like me, I can enter. I have visas for almost everywhere I need to go. But because of the team, so they need to present. It's dependent on but we're still going to do meetings. No, no, but it's not, it's not that tight. Uh, most, of the, most of the real meetings that are fixed, of course, she gets to know. But these ones are not uh, yet concrete. They are not, uh, they are not fixed. So that's why. that's why. And it's not her department, so that's why they didn't put her to tell her. <laughs> yeah. so and, uh, and, by the way, and by the way, we, we want to get on your calendar for 2024. How many of you, you want see. them to come back again? Yeah. So, so, so I'm saying it in front of your wife now. Yes. So. 
Yes. Yeah. So 2024, Pastor K and Pastor Midvet are coming back here. Yes. So the, this next question is about four or five people have asked this question. It has to do with delayed marriage. So it's, uh, we have people say, well, I'm more than 35. Do I have to go through this relationship thing, friendship thing, or should I jump right into it? And people are saying, how can I make this happen quickly? I am getting old. There's a question about worry. If somebody says, look, I'm getting worried. I'm more than 35 right now. It looks like this is not happening to me. And I'm competing with people who are in their 20s. And then it's, uh, it's becoming a challenge uh, to me. And so there's a number of questions about worry, uh, delayed marriage. What do I do to accelerate the process? I really want to get married, but nobody's asking me out. Is there anything more than what I'm doing that I can do to make it happen? So I'm, I'm, now I'm worried about your worry because <laughs> um, worry is dangerous. Worry is dangerous. Worry is you saying, I can do a better job than God is doing. Because the reason why you're anxious is you think that God is not on top of it. That's the only reason why you get anxious. Why you feel like, oh, why is this thing not happening as fast? If I were in charge, I would have made this happen. No. Um, I still think that the Bi because the Bible says that whatever we're going to get, we have to get it by following them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. There must be the faith and the patience for it to happen. Now, when it comes to things, I'm sure this question is from women because women don't really, when it comes to things that you can't control by yourself, you have to learn to still trust God. And one of the reasons why you are panicking also is that you feel that, someone said it, I'm competing with 20-year-olds. You don't need many men. You need one man. So no, you're not really in competition. What you should be doing is trusting God to position you so that that one man will find you. So you don't need to have many men. You just need one man. And the reason why you're panicking is because you think that somebody can go and take yours. If something is rightfully yours and has been promised to you by God, if you trust God and you position yourself well, you will get it. Um, I also would like to ask, when you say you've done everything, what do you mean by that? You know, sometimes people think they've done everything. But have they really? You know? um, for me, I've had, I've had to wait. I, I mean, I've not had to wait for a lot of things in my life. But I had to wait when it came to having children. Uh, in fact, at the beginning, I thought it would never happen. Because doctors had told me that I may never have children. And this, I'd heard this for so long. And the thing I feared most now became my reality in marriage. So, of course, the children, the years were delaying. Every year, I wasn't getting pregnant. Every year, I wasn't getting pregnant. And I thought I was in faith. The first three years, I thought I was in faith. And I was doing everything I thought I knew to do. I was going from doctor to doctor. I would pray. I would join prayer lines. I was doing all those things, jumping around. And my husband said something one day to me. He said, you are not in faith. Ah, that's in pain me. Can't even lie. Pain me because I was like, what do you mean I'm not in faith? I'm the one that wake up in the morning, my voice will be loud. You, you've not even prayed once about this thing. Of course, I never really said it to him. But that's what I was thinking in my heart. I was like, how dare you? How dare you say that I'm not in faith? I've never heard you one day say, let's pray. I've never heard you say, bring your hand, let's join in faith and pray about this thing. What he used to say to me was, I would never pray about children because I have my children. You know, and at the time, it sounded like arrogance, but it was faith. It was faith in its purest form. I was one jumping around. I was worried. And you see, faith and worry can't work together in the same heart. The same heart cannot produce faith if it has worry in it. And without faith, it is impossible. Whether it is to please God, whether it is to have babies, whether it is get married, without faith, it is impossible. So I had to get to the point where I started asking myself, what exactly is faith and what am I supposed to do? And the first thing Pasquet asked me one day, he said, what are you standing on? What promise are you standing on? Because sometimes you can say, oh, God promised me I'm going to get married. What, where? Half the time people don't even know. You can't tell me categorically what God said to you, what God promised you, what scripture is it, what are you standing on? I've done everything I know to do. It's probably positioning yourself well, going out more, making up dressing up well, making yourself available. 
But for us as believers, there's a spiritual side to things. You must first get it in the spiritual realm before it manifests in the physical. So you first get your spouse spiritually by faith. Know that I already have the person God has promised me, and you have a word for it. None shall lack her mate, for his spirit will gather them together. You tell yourself that my king is coming to me, riding on a coat. You have scriptures you are standing on, and this is your relationship with God. And the thing about faith is that it's, it's a constant trust in God. You are following. God says, stand there, you stand. You don't ask questions. He says, jump now. You don't start saying, oh, I don't know who's looking. Jump. Maybe it's a time you jump that your husband just walks in and says, oh, who is this girl that just jumped? But that's how God works. So you have to move from worry to faith because Hallelujah. worry is not going to bring any result. It's going to make you older. It's going to make you unattractive. And at the end of the day, there will be no result. Jesus said, by worrying, which of you can, can, add, make, can add one one cubit to your stature? Mm. So it's, it's useless, really. So I think that you need to go, because for me, I had to go into the word. Mm. And I don't know if I'm going to have time tomorrow to share, mm. but that's what God did on my heart, to share that mm. journey of waiting. I had to go into the word, and I had to get my victory from the word. So Praise by God. faith, you will get your husband. You don't Hallelujah. need many men. You're not in competition. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not in competition. It's Hallelujah. about position, not competition. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Pastor Midred. <clears throat> so there are, number, there are a number of questions here that I think are out of scope. So I'll use my... Uh, um, um, I will... I will... I will... I'll video because I mean there are important questions about sex toys and why is somebody holding back the breast? You talked a lot about breast. Somebody was asking about the breast dimension of uh, of sexual intercourse and so on. But there's there are some questions here that came up repeat just in repetition. So I think this was probably from sisters, and it revolves around men they've been dating for. A, a number of years and the man is not committing and the man is saying I'm not ready but the relationship is three, four, five, seven years I'm not ready one of them, the man is also expressing interest in other women while reassuring her that she's the one and the thing is, is still waiting and she's saying can I continue to wait for him, I like him but, but he's interested in other people and so there's this three or four questions about men who are not committing. They are interested but not committed. And the ladies are asking, what do we do with those men? <laughs> All right. Um, interestingly, we touched that a bit today. Yes. Um, men don't have biological clock. Men have financial clock. Mm -hmm. So a man can meet you, and as long as he's getting the benefits of marriage, I suspect in all these cases that the man is gaining something. Men get incredibly demotivated the moment they are getting everything they want. Men are baseline people. Women can do things for emotion and for compassion. Men are baseline people. We are wired that way. We are project driven. Once a project is completed, we are demotivated. So, um, if a guy is in your life, in the time he's asking you, I didn't have time to go into that today. In the time he's about to start, define what we are doing and how long it is. Don't enter it, start sleeping with him, start cooking for him, and you want to motivate him. It's like somebody enters medical school from year one and you give him certificate that you have, you're a doctor. When you have time, come for lecture. <laughs> and when you have time, read for exam. What are the chances he will read for exam? What are the chances he will sleep, stay awake overnight reading? Never. He's, he has a certificate. So that's what a lot of men are doing. You've trained him in one direction and you want to retrain him. No. So when you're dealing, men like, women think men, men will see it as weird when you know what you want. No. Men will, a man that really likes you will like that. A man that wants to waste your time is the one that will try to shy away from definition. He wants to waste your time. A man that is purpose-driven, he doesn't mind that you know what you want out of life. So let him know that, hey, I like you too, but we can't be in something indefinite. I need to know when we're going to get married. If you're not ready, why are you not ready? If it's money, I'll, I'll chip in my money too. Let's get it going. And always for a woman as a standard, please, if you are going to start something with a man, get your pastors or mentors or somebody higher than both of you involved because... It's easier for a neutral person to speak than for you to keep saying, marry me, marry me. When you have a mentor, a pastor involved, 
He can speak. If you've ever been to a wedding where they didn't serve you food, it's easier for somebody else to say, oh, you guys have not served that table. Then you in the table, you are pretending like, you know, ah, we're well, okay. Oh. But somebody else is fighting for you that served this table. It's better than you shouting, we have not served our table. All right, so always get other people involved. Um, it makes a man serious. As opposed to he's toasty, talking to you and talking to five other women, all of you are deceiving you know, yourselves and he's just wasting your time. Don't let the guy waste your time. When men are serious, they marry. When they're serious, they marry. They don't, they don't waste your time. All right, so you define it and let it go. And if you have been given benefits, that's a, that's a big demotivation for him. Okay, praise the Lord. Give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. So, I think I'll bundle up three questions and I think we'll stop there. I think this question has to do with, I'm bundling up about three or four questions, but the basic premise of this is, how do you rekindle your love uh, in a married to relationship? This one says the wife is a believer. Uh, she's always praying and praying. Doesn't indicate any interest in sex at all. How do you approach this as a believer when she's always saying she's tired and always praying? So, this is uh, like um, uh, a... a, a, a I think this person married a prayer warrior. <laughs> and, uh, and the prayer warrior is not interested in anything of the earth, but only things that have to do with heaven. So there has been a, a number of questions about marital relationships where the love, especially sexual love, has become absent or diminished. And the question is, how do you rekindle it? And specifically, if your spouse is very prayerful and doesn't like... Uh, sexual activity because he's a, if he wants to be on the mountain, he's fasting all the time. You know, how do you deal with a fasting <laughs> spouse? You didn't talk about the one of breast. You said you know some on breast. Oh, bre so there was one. Uh, they said, well, this one says my husband doesn't like oral sex, and the other one talks about sex toys. When to use sex toys, and the other one said he likes breast uh, a lot, but the wife doesn't allow him to do the breast. But I, I didn't want to go in that direction because there are young people, young people. in, in, in the. In, in, but they know more than us, Pastor. Those young people, what they know is more than what we know. Yeah, so, so maybe let's do with the one of uh, rekindling sexual. For, I see mainly like sexual intimacy in marriage. When that is dead, uh, when one spouse is always tired or always fasting and praying. Okay, I think information is important. Um, you have to speak your partner's language. So, for instance, this person that likes to pray. We, you can pray with her. Yes, pray the scriptures. As you're praying, tell her that, Father, I thank you because her breast will satisfy me at all times. And we will always be enraptured by each other's love. It will manifest tonight in the name of Jesus. Tonight. When you finish amen, you just start to unbutton the blouse. Because we have to manifest what we have prayed. Pray for yes. Yeah, so Hallelujah, somebody. The reason why she probably feels more spiritual than you, she probably doesn't feel that you're meeting that need. Once, it, once somebody feels their need, their need is met, they want to reward you. Yes. So, obviously, she feels like maybe you are not engaging spiritually enough. You're not, so, you can, you can try to engage a little bit more. Um, in rekindling love, I always say, do the things you did at the beginning. People forget. You say a certain way you started out your relationship. You would go date nights. You would take her out. You would write love love notes, do mixtapes, whatever you did back then. You know, do it again. People just get she, by now. She should know I love her now. No, she doesn't. Remind her. Remind her. Tell her nice things all day. But I mean, that's why Pastor K's book is there. How to make love to a woman without touching her. Do the things that she wants. A lot of men don't know that women are frustrated. She's not frustrated from work or anything. She's frustrated from you not listening. She's telling you the same thing over and over again. You're not doing it. Yeah. And then the night you want to come and touch me. It's, it, it does nothing add up. Mm -hmm. She wants you to be on the same page with you. She will be the one chasing you. A lot of men don't know that. You can get your wife to be the one chasing you around the room. Maybe that will, be the topic, that will be the topic of the next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the men <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> if you do the things she wants, she will chase you around the room. But a lot of times, men don't. They just think, women are, women are not like men. We're not always in the mood. You have to do something to make me be in the mood. We have to, I have to be emotionally involved. We have to be 
Things have to be working. We have to be friends. Things have to be almost perfect. So mm. you will notice that sometimes you're even trying to sleep with your wife and she's asking you, oh, have you locked the door? Have you? Mm. Because she doesn't want any mistakes, yeah, any errors. You know, she wants things perfect. Mm. So if you're also treating her nice all day, send her messages, you have to, pr like women are like that, you have to prep for surgery in quotes. You have to prep her. You can't just come and just say, you are in, so, oh God, shift, I won't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's when she will be tired. Yeah. But if you've been nice all day, she's the one even before you go, she has cooked a meal for you. She's already after she has cooked one meal, she presents the second. Mm -hmm. Just... oh. Give the Lord a big, big pay. Yeah, this is this is fantastic. So, Pastor K, as you are adding this one, since we are talking about a, emotional connection, one thing I missed is 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 it right for a woman to be the one to initiate? Uh, sex within marriage. So that's that's part of that question. And then we we'll right. take two more, and then we we'll go. All right. Um, there's no rule as to who should initiate. Both, both parties should initiate. Um, if you are in a marriage where you are even ashamed or afraid to initiate, then there's deeper problems than that. The two should initiate. You should only leave it to one person to initiate all the time. All right. Everybody wants to feel wanted. It's part of what turns people on for sex, that they are admirable and that they are wanted by you. So it's important you pursue your spouse. And um, if your partner is the type that avoids sex, maybe using prayer or other things to cover it, you, you need to talk to um, a sexologist, a Christian one, or a counselor. We have a ministry called Wholesome Sexuality, where we, because we had, there were a lot of sexual questions in churches that people were not addressing. So we started a ministry, got a Christian sexologist to handle it. It's called Wholesome Sexuality. It's on Instagram and YouTube. Mm -hmm. So you can re talk to somebody like that. It's not natural for someone not to like sex. So once you see a man or a woman that doesn't like sex, there is a reason behind it. It's not natural. So um, the person will investigate and find out, is there trauma? Is there the a reason why they hate sex? Is there a past experience about sex? Or sometimes a mental block. They, some people think sex is not holy. Yeah. Some people say the way we are on the altar talking about sex. That, you, know, yes. you can't be holier than God. The holy Spirit is never sex is inside the Bible. The Bible is called the Holy of. Bible. <laughs> so there's sex inside. So we, there's a reason why somebody's not enjoying sex, basically. As a human being, you were created to enjoy sex, whether you are male or female. All right? So, yes. Uh, thank you. Praise God. Can we put our hands together? I think two more questions and we'll get... So, we, we, let's pivot a little bit. So, most of the questions I'm going to be asking is different. So, this is about people who have been married before. One of them have been married with five children. And she said, look, I've been married with five children. My husband has left me for somebody else. And uh, how do I rekindle interest in a new relationship when I've been down and out? So there have been a, a number of uh, questions about life after a hurting relationship. How do we rebound again? I would love somebody wanted to marry him, the person disappointed me. I got married, had kids, the marriage failed. How do I get back on my feet to love again, to live again, to dream again, and maybe to marry again? Okay, it's a whole journey, but I would just, just so that we save time, I would recommend Pascal didn't talk about it, but there's a book, I believe it's here, called Heal Before You Deal. We took time to break down what you need to do, the steps um, that you need to take. But one of the major things would be forgiveness. You have to forgive yourself first. Because a lot of people blame themselves. I made bad decisions. Why did I did it? You have to forgive yourself. Second, you have to forgive the person. You have to let it go. Because if not, what will happen is that the, how does Pascal say it's the next, you punish, punish your next for the sins of your ex. You know, the person didn't do anything, but what, sometimes they do something and it triggers you because you remember that, ah, this thing is looking like something that my ex used to do. And so that person is unfortunately suffering for something, for some mistakes they've never made. So forgiveness will be key in that process. Then you need to ask yourself, what lessons did I learn? What, did I, what part did I play in that thing going wrong? Because it always takes two people. A lot of times people say things like that, but it always takes two people. There would have been something, you missed something somewhere, or you did something somewhere, or you allowed something, or you accepted something. Because a lot of people complain about what they accept, but if you allow something, you shouldn't complain about it. So you need to ask yourself, what lessons did I learn in that relationship? Um, and then going forward, who, who I need to get, I, I think you need to get counsel 
you know don't if you've messed up before or your heart has been broken before you need to talk to someone there's nothing wrong with having these conversations we make it seem as if there's something wrong with if you go to somebody and talk counseling or, or therapy that means that you are your christianity yeah. is not firm it's not strong mm -hmm. it's not the real kind but no you in the multitude of counsel there's safety, there's safety. so i don't know if i missed it before was there something you talk to someone the person and say oh look at this thing because you were in love we're not in love we can see that guy's behavior is not good the way he even spoke the other day this guy has anger issues this one that is coming to is like that why can't you see it do you have a pattern for picking this kind of people so someone two or three people can tell you categorically that this is not the right move or they'll say oh no you're just overreacting because of what has happened to you before so heal before you deal is a good book i think you should buy it okay. is the book here Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, praise God. Pastor K, do you have any other thing to add to that or should we go to our last question? A uh, person just needs to change their mindset, how they see themselves. Because hmm. obviously they're carrying the baggage with them. Yeah, from the past. So yeah. life is, people, people have married three times, four times. So don't think that because you missed it once and you have children, it makes you out of the market. No, there's someone out there that will love you. So you need to change your own mindset. You're not disadvantaged. Learn the lessons, heal before you deal. And the world is still open. You can still marry at any age. Trust God. There are people looking for marriage at any age. So be in faith. Many people are thinking about general scarcity. Focus on yourself. It's like saying there's no money in America. No. You can have money. All right. Leave general, leave what poverty. That's not your problem now. And so don't say there are no men. No, it's not men. It's one. I think God can arrange one. Yeah. Yes, let's stay on that. Yes. Give the Lord a big hand, everybody. This is powerful. So, apologies if we didn't get to your question. I'm trying to get to as many of them as possible. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to start early. Uh, I've told him already. Uh, we're going to give him the microphone to preach, and we're going to have a Q&A session before uh, uh, they leave. The last question has to deal with something. I mean, I'm putting together two or three questions together, but I think the premise here is about busy parents, and you alluded to it. And, and the woman says, I want to be a working class woman. I want to be a high income earner. How do I eat my cake and have it? How can I be a busy woman? My husband is already busy. Uh, how can we both be busy, make a lot of money, and still keep a family? So there's been a number of questions about being a, a, a mom at home, um, parents who are too busy to even have time for themselves not to talk about it, their children. So how do you navigate a country where maybe one income is not enough as it were for the family and the man and the woman have to go work and because of that their relationship is suffering and the children are suffering as well. What's the middle ground there? Okay. Um, we also live very busy lives. He's busy. I'm busy. Besides church, his ministry, I run my own ministry and he has many expressions, so we're very busy. He's still running school, a lot of things. Um, I would say quality over quantity, right? If you can't spend so much time together as husband and wife, when you do spend time together, make it memorable. Make it things you can really remember. Um, for your children, I would say you still need to find a way to prioritize them and still use the principle of quality over quantity. So for us, we may not be around, like this year, we're not around a lot, but every time there's a holiday, the children are with us. So whether we're in, we're going to Singapore, we move everybody to Singapore for that holiday. If we're going to America, we're, the last the US tour we did, my children were on holiday, they were with us throughout the time you know so we we make sure we make sure that every time we're on holiday we do special things together you know we can do disney we can do whatever something that will make it things they can remember because truth is children don't always remember everything but they will remember that special time yeah. oh that time you were running or you know daddy taught me how to ride a bike or that time mommy took me shopping for this you know special occasions like that mm. um also i think we need to also leverage, you know, I don't know, it's with the way the world is now, but when we're growing up, constantly you would hear that it takes a village. Yeah. So community. Mm. And I think that even if you can't get it outside, you can get community in, in the church. church. church yeah. the, he puts the solitude in families. That's what God does. So you can get community in church. There can be moments where you create or where a group of friends and 
this weekend maybe we'll have all the children with you mm. so we can go out yeah. next weekend we have the children mm. with us so you can go out yeah. you know create systems that work mm. so i think it's not impossible for you to have it all mm. i think you can't have it all but you must try to create balance priority prioritize you know quality over quantity um take advantage of the people in your life, you know, creating community, letting them help you. Mm. Um, ask for help when you need it. Mm. Then try to take time away. There must be, even if it's once a year that you take time off, mm. take time off. You must. If not, you die. Yes. And at the end of the day, it will all be wasted. Mm -hmm. You know, so yes. you must take time away from it. We, we, even though we travel with, I mean, this last couple of days have been hectic, but it still has been very special because I told myself it feels like when we first got married because that uh, we can just move, no kids, no nothing, no team members. The last lap of this trip, this U.S., no team members. We've just been two of us doing everything together and it's really nice, you know. So we still find time to spend time together and then when we get home, like this Christmas, we know it's us and the kids, you know. So just find a way around it. All right. And I would like to add, um, bring, God, bring God back to the center of the of your life um why do you want to have a lot of money why do you want to have all these big things and if you want to have all these big things do you think you need to walk your way into it or you can trust god for it there's a difference bring god back when you bring god back god will demand you give the sabbath to him that's a certain amount of time for him and also give the tithe many people are trying to walk their way into prosperity the trick of walking your way to prosperity is that you, you need to work more when you want more. So that's the trick. When you have a bigger house, you have a bigger property tax. Yes. You, have a big, you need a bigger car. You need a, so the trick of bigger is that you need to work a bit more. But when you put those dreams as a God project, you will find that God can still get you to that end point without having to draw time from your family life all the time. So bring God back in, in terms of your Sabbath, dedicating time to God, and your tithe. You, you bring money under God. Don't make money your God. Because money always wants to compete with God. You say, you can't serve God, uh, mammon. So money competes with God. You say, work hard, I'll give you more. No, bring your money. Start to tithe as a family. Start to give as a family. That way you're saying, God, you're our source, yeah. not yeah. our career. Hallelujah. So we can get a big house. Yes. It might not be... Uh, you know, from working harder. All right? If we have time tomorrow, we might even talk a bit about that. Because I know finances is, is what tricks people into. Oh, we must work hard. Both of us must. At the end of the day, you need to check what your real goal is. Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it the, is it the paper? Is it the balance sheet? Mm -hmm. Like Pastor said earlier, you know you're not taking this money anywhere. Mm -hmm. You're going to leave it here. Yeah. And what you leave in your children is more important than what you leave for your children. Give the Lord a big hand, everybody. Thank you so much.